All right, we continue chapter five of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, how it works. We are at the bottom of page 69. In this way, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? We asked God to mold our ideas and help us to live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or loathed. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, provided that we do not bring about still more harm in doing so. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with other persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. Suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we are going to get drunk? Some people tell us so. But this is only a half-truth. It depends upon us and our motives. If we are sorry for what we have done and have the honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we will be forgiven and will have learnt our lesson. If we are not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we are quite sure to drink. We are not theorizing. These are facts out of our experience. To sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity and for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperilous urge when to yield would mean heartache. If we have been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. We have begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward men, even our enemies. We look on them as sick people. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. In this book, you read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you are convinced now that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from him. If you have already made a decision and an inventory of grosser handicaps, you have made a good beginning. That being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. Alrighty, so we'll back it up to that first chapter, and we had left off the previous um, recording at that chapter, and so we've already subjected each relation to this test, was it selfish or not. Now we're going to move forward, and we're going to ask God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them. So we're going to do this through prayer and meditation, and it's not praying for the ideal partner. A lot of people... Um, do such a thing and that's getting into self-will. What does my perfect partner want? What do I want from my partner? We want to find God's ideal relationship. Um, it's not just our sexual relationship or a dating relationship. It can also be any healthy relationship, a uh, friendship. Um, I've also done this meditation with what my ideal business would look like how I would like my business to come forth. Um, so we sit in prayer and meditation and we look for the ideal relationship and we write that down. And then it says we want to grow toward it. Um, so no matter what our ideals turn out to be, I mean, we can't expect to come into a relationship with all of these ideals and not be that ideal person as well. So we want to grow along spiritual lines so that we too match up to these ideals. Um, 
and I found that to be quite helpful. Um, if we turn the page to 70, in the middle paragraph there, it says, if sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves harder into helping others. It quiets the imperilous urge when to yield would mean heartache. I remember my previous sponsor had told me over and over and over when I was having trouble in dating, calm the imperilous urge, Kimberly, go work with others. And I hated it. It made me cringe every time. But what I found through my experience of this is the more I got into working with others, the more I got out of self, the more I tried to push my will on my want of having a boyfriend, um, and I grew towards my ideals. And through working with others, I was able to learn about myself, grow along spiritual lines, gain self-confidence. And I became that ideal. So when the time was right, I was able to meet someone who also had grown to those ideals and come together and, uh, you know, see where that takes us. Um, and then it says in that paragraph above, suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we are going to get drunk? Well, this is where we remember it's progress, not perfection, right? As long as we are learning, doing the next right thing, growing along spiritual lines. We're not going out and running on self-will, um, getting into selfish relationships. We're not intentionally causing harm. Sometimes we stumble, yes, but if our intention is pure and good, we won't drink. But if we fail to grow along spiritual lines, we fail to learn our lesson, um, we fail to ask God to help mold us to be our ideals, um, and we fall back on old behaviors, then our conduct continues to harm others, and we are quite sure to drink. And we come to the bottom and it starts talking about looking at that personal inventory and how we've digested a lot of truths about ourselves. And we're going to move into the next chapter where we're going to get talking about step five, which is where we share those, um, those inner darkest secrets with another person and with God. And we want to be willing to straighten out the past. That's getting into our step eight and nine. Um, it says, we read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves, that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from him. So self-will is these resentments, these fears, these conducts we've done, and these harms we've made. And those are the things that are blocking us from the sunlight of the spirit. We read about that previously in this chapter. And those are the things that are blocking us off from God. And so this is our chance to clear those away, to clear that path to God so we can have that conscious contact with our creator. Um, and it says, if we have made a decision, hopefully if you're at this point, you have made that decision. Um, and we have made a handicap, an inventory of our grocer handicaps. This is a good beginning. Again, there's that term, good beginning. This is not an end. This is a beginning. It's not, I did a set of steps and I'm done. I did a set of steps and I am now going to continue to grow this relationship with God because this is the beginning I've made. I've made a beginning with my contact to my higher power and I've made a beginning in my program of recovery and I need to continue to grow and continue to build that relationship as I go along. Now this is a re-recording as I was traveling on Friday and the recording didn't work so unfortunately we don't have the discussion um, but stay tuned to the next recording because it does have more further discussion. Thank you.